So if I was to ask you right now, if an enemy wanted to attack our country, U.S., let's just say, how would they do it? You may say, well, Pat, they're going to do cyber. They're going to do bio warfare. No, they're going to do nuclear. What if I told you they could do it with water? If U.S. had a water crisis and you and I don't have water, you know how long we can go without water? Three days. Some say up to a week, but most studies say three days. And one of the biggest crises we're dealing with right now worldwide is water crisis. When I show you some of the statistics on what it's looking like, when you watch the movie Big Short, if you remember the movie Big Short with Michael Burry, one of the biggest investors that everybody worldwide follows, he's got this hedge fund called Scion Hedge Fund that I think he manages nearly $2 billion. You know what's, what it said at the end of the movie? They said, Michael Burry, his next investment and in commodity that he's focused on is only one thing and what do you think it was water we're gonna take a deep dive why so many people around the world are worried about the water crisis Okay, so if you get value out of this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it. According to a UN water conference, the world faces a 40% shortfall in fresh water supply by 2030. And when we break down water on how much we use worldwide, we use more than 4 trillion cubic meters of fresh water per year. And just to kind of put that in context on how much 4 trillion cubic meters is, one cubic meter equals 264 gallons of water, one cubic meter. So now let's continue. Pat, what do you mean by all this water? Don't we have all this water, the ocean? Why should we be worried about water? 71% of Earth's surface is covered by water. That should be good news, no? Well, there's a difference between what kind of water we drink. Watch this. 97% of Earth's water is salt water. 2% is fresh water trapped in glaciers. 0.65% is the fresh water that we use for everything, such as drinking. Let's focus on this 0.65%. Where do we get this fresh water from? Here's what it looks like. 75% of it is withdrawn each year from rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. 25% comes from groundwater aquifers. And 80% of the water withdrawn in the U.S. is used for cooling electric power plants and for irrigation. So, so I just want to give you a visual here. When you look at two of the reservoirs, the largest reservoirs we have in U.S., you'll see Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And if you look at these pictures, both of them have experienced critically low levels recently. Here's what it looks like in 2000 versus today. In 2000, these two reservoirs were full. 95% they were full. Today, they're roughly 25%, said Brad Udall, a water and climate scientist at Colorado State University. It's hard to overstate how important the Colorado River is to the entire American Southwest. Now, you may say, I'm not a math guy. Look, 95% just 23 years ago. To today, 25%, no matter what the number is, that's not a good thing on, on what the numbers are looking like. Where we've gone to where we are today. Today's sponsor is BetterHelp, and it's interesting because just today we were doing a podcast, and one of the articles that we read by Wall Street Journal said that four out of 10 Americans don't have a best friend. What does that mean? And a couple months ago, another article came out talking about the lonely epidemic. People don't have somebody to talk to during COVID. We were alone, we were by ourselves. Half the time, you need somebody to talk to. Even as a business owner, entrepreneur, founder myself, the last 20 years, many times I've been by myself. I can't talk to my wife, I can't talk to my family. I chose to start a business. Who am I gonna go complain to? Sometimes you just need somebody to talk to. What BetterHelp does is, on their website, BetterHelp offers 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists. You get to pick and choose the questionnaire. You get to pick and choose the topics. You answer a certain set of questions, and they match it with therapists that are best suited for you. And then from there, you get to have a conversation with somebody. And if it doesn't work out for you, they'll replace it with somebody else as well. So if this is something that you're dealing with, you want to talk to somebody, go to betterhelp.com forward slash value team. You'll get 10% discount on your first month. Again, go to betterhelp.com forward slash value team. You'll get 10% discount on your first month. So now let's take a look at how much water we domestically have been withdrawn since 1960. When you look at this chart, here's what it shows. If you look at the dark blue, it's domestic, then industrial, then total irrigation on livestock. So obviously 600% increase since 1960, that's 73 years ago to today. That's not a good thing to see. However, 70% of the freshwater withdrawals are used for agriculture purposes, 20% for industrial use, the rest of the 10% is used for domestic, you and I drinking water. By 2050, water demand is expected to increase from 20 to 30 percent. And by the way, when we're saying 2050, I want to show you what the comparable was of where we were in 2010 and what they're expecting to be by 2050. In 2010, 1.9 billion people lived in severely water scarce places, and this number is expected to increase to 3.2 billion by 2050. So now, if you wanted to find out where is the fresh water scarcity trend worldwide, here, here's what we would look at. If we look at this chart here, you will look at the numbers to the right that says 
100 percent. So northern Africa, 100 percent. Middle East, South Asia, they're not in a good place. And second worst would be East Asia. And you could look at uh, Southern Africa. And if you were to say which ones are the best, you got North America, South America and Australia Pacific all at 25 percent. Now, when you look at this, you know, the issue with water, there's been many scandals with water over the years. I'll give you one of them, especially with Nestle. When it was discovered that Flint, Michigan's lead tainted pipes created a local water crisis, the government originally gave out free bottled waters, but it eventually ended. And at the same time, Department of Environmental Quality had approved Nestle's request to increase the amount of water it pumps from the Great Lakes. In the same month, the state decided to stop giving free bottled water to Flint. It was effectively deciding to give away millions of gallons to multinational corporations besides a one-time $5,000 permit application fee under Michigan law. Nestle, the largest food and beverage company in the world, must pay the state only $200 every year. Administrative fee to bottle and sell 400 gallons a minute of Michigan groundwater. And that's just Nestle in Michigan. Now let's look at Nestle in California. Nestle has maintained that its rights to California spring water date back to 1865, but a 2017 investigation found that Nestle was taking far more than its share. In 2020, the company drew out about 58 million gallons, far surpassing the 2.3 million gallons a year. It could validly claim, according to the report, Nestle has taken on average 25 times as much water as it may have a right to, according to the story of a stuff project and environmental group that has been fighting to stop the bottled water company's operation in California for years, while California is facing record droughts and wildfires. So now, every time there's a crisis, there's opportunity. Why? Because a capitalist or an entrepreneur can come in and say, let's solve this problem. If we can solve this problem, there could be a lot of incentives for it as well. So watch what's been happening with this. Matthew Desiri, the president and co-founder of the hedge fund Water Asset Management, that's literally what it's called, called the U.S. water business the biggest emerging market on earth, a trillion dollar market opportunity. And matter of fact, like I told you earlier, even Michael Burry at the end of the movie in Big Short said that his focus had become on one commodity and that is water. Here's what he said in an interview in 2015. Transporting water is impractical for both political and physical reasons, so buying up water rights did not make a lot of sense to me. What became clear to me is that food is the way to invest in water, that is, grow food in water-rich areas and transport it for sale in water poor areas. This is the method for redistributing water that is least contentious and ultimately can be profitable, which will ensure that this redistribution is sustainable. And he said the following about wine. Those of you guys that drink wine, you ready for this? A bottle of wine takes over 400 bottles of water to produce the water embedded in food is what I have found interesting. So it just tells you, guys that are thinkers, they're gonna see opportunities to fix this problem, which means that's a good thing for us long term. There are three ways to invest into water. Number one, purchasing water rights. Number two, invest in water-rich farmland. And number three is invest in water utilities, infrastructure, and equipment. So now one of the technologies that can solve the problem is a process called the desalination, which is a process by which the dissolved mineral salts in water are removed. Currently, this process applied to seawater. One of the most used to obtain fresh water for human consumption or agriculture purposes. So, so if you look at this flow here, step number one is seawater intake. Step number two, the intake screening facility. Then it's pretreatment filters. Then it's reverse osmosis membrane. Units remove salt and other impurities from water. And then step number five is post-treatment to drinking water standard. Then you got step number six, drinking water supply tank. And then last but not least, step number seven, seawater concentrate outlet. All of this process turns seawater into drinking water. It looks like a technical process, but one of the largest desalination plants in the world is Sorek Desalination Plant is located south of Tel Aviv, Israel, and it produces 137 million gallons of potable water a day. And the largest plant we have in the U.S. is in Carlsbad, San Diego, which produces roughly 50 million gallons of water per day. So this is all good news because once, uh, you know, the world found out that this was a problem, people started looking into us. And this started in 1960. And if you look at this chart here, you'll see the growth of desalination globally from 1960 to 2020. It's climbing and the cost of desalinated water has been coming down as the technology evolved. Matter of fact, in the last three decades, the cost of desalination has dropped by more than half. And even globally, more than 300 million people now get their water from desalination plants from the U.S. Southwest to China. But there are some that focus on it more than others, such as Saudi Arabia, which produces 20% of the world's desalinated water with 9 million cubic meters produced per day, 60% of 
its water is desalinated. And according to Statista, if you look at this, Saudi Arabia is investing heavily in desalination. Here's what it's looking like. If you look at the left, you'll see Saudi Arabia at the top, then it's UAE, then it's Jordan, Egypt, Oman, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Kuwait, and others. So when you're looking at this, of course, any way we see as a solution, you think about it and say, okay, the future looks bright. There's people that are working on this. Now, there's certain people that say there's downsides to desalination with one of them being it uses a lot of energy, could be bad for the environment, it hurts the fish. Desalinated water is more expensive than imported water. And for every gallon of fresh water created, one and a half gallons of salt water is created and sent back into the ocean. And some argue that this is a problem and the state of California has increasingly taken an anti-desalination position, citing environmental reasons. So, so final thoughts on this water, on how I'm processing it. Number one, I trust capitalism. What do I mean by capitalism? Whoever's going to be negatively impacted by this has to fix this. So let's look at drink companies. Who would be negatively impacted by this? Coffee relies on water. So that's who? Coffee being Starbucks, 7-Eleven. Soda is going to be impacted by this, which is who? Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all the other guys. They got to figure this out. Water companies are going to be impacted. There's so many companies that are going to be impacted by this. If it got so bad, they would all gather their resources to figure out a way to fight against the water crisis. So that's one. There's too much money involved that there's no way they're going to allow this to happen. Number two, technology advancement. I was at Harvard. One guy is sitting there from Lagos and he says, here's what we created. We're raising money right now. Each plant is $100 million and we're able to raise this much money. And if we do this, this is how many gallons of water we can produce on a daily basis. I'm like, okay, this is good. It was a creative way that they were doing it, creating clouds and all this stuff. Very interesting the way he was doing it. It was very different than desalination. But outside of that, I want to give you a project, an operation that the CIA I worked on in the 60s called Operation Popeye. I don't know if you've heard about this or not, but we've known how to make rain, fake rain, look real for decades. And we've kept it kind of on the hush-hush and we use words such as allegedly, but let me kind of read this to you so you can kind of get an idea what this Operation Popeye was about. It wasn't about the Popeye with the big forearm you're talking about. It's a different kind of a Popeye. So Operation Popeye was a military cloud seeding project carried out by the U.S. Air Force during the Vietnam War in 1967 to 72. The highly classified program program attempted to extend the monsoon season over specific areas of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in order to disrupt the North Vietnamese military supplies by softening roads, surfaces, and causing landslides. The former U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was aware that there might be objections raised by the international scientific community, but said in a memo to the president that such objections had not in the past been a basis for prevention of military activities considered to be in the interest of U.S. national security and the chemical weather modification program was conducted from Thailand over Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and allegedly sponsored by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and the CIA, without the authorization of then Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, who had categorically denied to Congress that a program for modification of weather for use as tactical weapon ever existed. So remember, keyword, allegedly, right? Allegedly that this happened, but if that's something they did back in the days, and it turned into a story like this, That means there's plenty of people that have the technology that if they really wanted to create rain, and even Michio Kaku had on the podcast before, we interviewed him. He was once sitting down, I think it's with Good Morning USA, Good Morning America, whatever the show is, and he's explaining to them how through laser technology, they're able to manipulate to create rain, and this has been around for a long time, and we can do this today. So again, advancement, I trust it's out there. Capitalists, I trust, are going to figure out a way through using technology. And I just want to put this one thought in your head for you to be thinking about, because I truly believe only the paranoid survive, which is what Andy Grove said. FDR once said the following, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Why am I saying that quote to you? If in the future, you all of a sudden find yourself with news that's being shared to you to scare you with water crisis, and this is why we have to, whatever, shut down, eat, you know, mosquitoes, or eat this, or eat that, or whatever way they're going to try to figure out to scare the hell out of you, always go back to you. Uh, wait a minute. We've been able to create rain. We've been able to do all this stuff for so many different decades. Why are you using the scare tactic? Just go back to, you know what the solutions are. Put that together. Don't use another crisis to be able to control me and scare the crap out of me so I can vote for you. Be tempted to question and push back when somebody uses that crisis against you. Having said that, if you got value out of this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you've never seen the video we did on uh, a vertical farming, incredible video we did on vertical farming, it's another crisis that has to do with farming. If you've not seen it, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.